And now, from the dark corners of the internet where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the bourbon flows steady, it's Paul Security Weekly! This podcast is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit them on the web at www.sans.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution at Tenable.com. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit BlackSquirrel.io for more information. Now it's time to fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer or other adult beverage, and give the intern control of your pot net because here's your host, a man tonight who very much looks like Jesse Pinkman, bitch. Paul Asadorian. Welcome to Security Weekly, bitches. Is that... Yo, Mr. Better? White! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Paul's Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. I'm very excited to be here in episode 403 for Thursday, January 22nd, 2015. Yes, and I am wearing a hat because it's cold. I was, I was just in Florida. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But... Um, these Sazeracs seem to be stirred a little bit more, but I, it's good. Yeah, it's a little, little. Uh, it needs more sugar to be mixed in with well, it. Well, the sugar's there. It's just sitting on the bottom. Yes. So hey, there's the two shot. Look, there's both of us. Hey, We're in the look. studio at the same time. Yay! Look at this. What? Wonderful. Woo! woo patches. You got some, you got some nice patches. That and really stands out. Woo woo! So Larry's of course here in the studio. Uh, very excited. Larry brought yes. bourbon, <coughs> which is uh, which is nice. Yes. Chris does not look like he likes the bourbon. Yes. Well, he doesn't like the Sazerac. It's a little too. Uh, it's a, yeah. Some, if, so, if, if someone gets us some sugar and a spoon, we can rectify. We that desperately situation. need Jack Daniel back on the show. Jack, <laughs> if you're out there, help us. On the lines via Skype, Mr. Joff Thire is with us. Welcome, Joff. Ah, oh, g'day, Paul. How are you? It's good to be here again. I'm. Uh, yeah, it's cold. I, we all want to go down to Florida this time. No, 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 no. We want to go to Puerto Rico. Where Mr. Hey, Carlos yeah. Perez is. Welcome, Carlos. Hey, Paul. It's a balmy 85 to 88 degrees yeah, over I'm here. Jealous. It's actually not that cold here in Rhode Island. It is, today. in fact, 36 degrees. Yeah, it's not that bad. It's very different from 70 degrees. Yes. Uh, I wanted to um, just send a note to Chris Turn while I do that. What about? Yeah. Um, yeah. Huh? Yes. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> speaking of the weather, the cold weather got you down? Warm up to embedded device security assessments. That's right. A two-day course taught by myself, me, Paul Sidorian, hosting the class at the SANS ICS Summit on February 25th through the 26th. Security Weekly listeners receive a 10% off discount code when using SECWEEK10. That's SECWEEK10, February 25th through the 26th in sunny Orlando, Florida at the Contemporary Resort at Disney. February 25th through the 26th. The link to register is in the show notes. Security Weekly listeners receive a 10% off discount. It's an awesome two-day course that you can uh, have me teach you for two days and we can hang out. And there is an all-new CTF. Uh, we're expanding the kind of CTF style um, activities that happen towards the end of the class. So Very nice. I teach you a bunch of stuff on how to reverse engineer and analyze security vulnerabilities in firmware. And then... There is more of me giving you random pieces of firmware and you reverse engineering them and telling me about the vulnerabilities that you find and then whoever finds the most wins a prize. And usually that's like a small little embedded router. So it's a very fun class uh, and it's a great time to go to Florida because as I experienced this week, it's a lot warmer in Florida than it here is here in Rhode Island and most of the Northeast and a lot of the rest of the country too. So Florida is a good place to be. And well, yeah. embedded and device business. security assessments are awesome. So come learn about them. Try that. See if that's any right, better. Carlos. And speaking of embedded devices, Carlos, I have a smart things hub now. I was telling you earlier, right? Ooh, yep. 
And uh, some of our coworkers at Tenable also have them as well. And uh, they're just awesome. I, I haven't started hacking it yet. I'm still in the, like, make it work phase. But I'm, I'm, I'm slowly trans, trans progressing to, like, the hacking phase. I don't know if you've looked yeah. at the security. Yeah, that, 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 that is until you talk with Josh Wright and then... You lose all interest in putting your C wave logs. <laughs> I'll play with that next week <laughs> or the week after. <laughs> so, yeah. It, all right. Well, we'll talk about that after. That's good. There's a new version coming out. I know. I'm, I'm gonna. gonna I want the new version. I'm actually thinking of buying the new version of Smart Things for my house and putting the older version here in the studio. So I'll have two Smart Things setups. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have uh, over one hundred dollars in. Open closed sensors arriving from Monoprice. Uh, oh, week. nice! Did they go on sale? Ah, uh, no, Monoprice. I got them for twenty-four dollars. So that's not bad. Monoprice. Monoprice. Yes, yeah. I'm going to be placing an order tonight for that stuff too, because I need way more open and closed sensors. Yeah, don't get their uh, present sensor, the motion detector. Yeah, it, it, you'll have to wait two minutes for it to actually reset. Oh, so it's really? going to be telling you you have motion, you have motion in this area for. Two minutes. Uh, it would be great for a vibrator, but not for a motion sensor. <laughs> okay, good to know. Larry, you're teaching <laughs> SAN 617 Wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense. Yes. Do you, do you cover Zigbee and Z-Wave? We cover Zig the heck out of Zigbee. Zigbee, um, not Z-Wave. We do not cover Z-Wave. However, I just taught the course last week mm -hmm. um, for an on-site, and um, I did do a demo of some Z-Wave stuff. Cool. Josh's Killer Z. Now it's a very small demo. It's very much. It's, yeah. We have some of the same problems because I haven't looked into the the protocol a lot, but we do. Uh, you know, I, I haven't that. read a whole heck of a lot about Zigbee and Z-Wave stuff recently. I mean, <coughs> a, a while back I looked into it, and Zigbee is becoming larger, given that these types of things are starting to make more yeah. of an impression in homes, yeah. and they're being sold by large retailers. My Philips Hue bulbs are Zigbee. Yep. And, yep. and Nest also has Zigbee. Nest has it, Zigbee yep. as well. Zigbee, Nest has Zigbee, and I think Z-Wave as well. Does it really? Wow. Yes. And in fact, I think it does more Z-Wave than Zigbee. And the last I knew, the Z-Wave radio was there but disabled in Nest. And it's yeah. all I, I know that I, I can get uh, Nest Protect connected via Zigbee. Nice. Too smart, thanks. The, the only thing that worries me is that I had a friend go to CS and he was looking at all of the C-Wave stuff. And they were saying, yeah, we're coming out with a new protocol. It addresses a bunch of vulnerabilities. And he went like, okay, so how uh, can I update my linear and GE and my other gear? No. You have to buy new stuff. You have to buy, you new, have to buy new stuff. And yeah, like, and I just oh, bought some crap. Jasco and, and GE light switches, which are kind of a pain in the ass to install. Yeah, you need them very close to the hub. So what I do typically is uh, I, just, I just get a power cable from an old computer, and I just put in leads into that cable, and then I do the uh, association right next to the hub, and then I take it over to the switch. Interesting. Nice. Have you played with Bitwise at all? I have not. Mr. Paul uh, Henry has, is, has joined us this evening. Paul, welcome to the show. We still have a couple here. of announcements, but go ahead. Yeah, I just want to mention it. I'm using Bitwise. You can use Python to control your Wemo devices. So I control a lot of lighting uh, with nice. the Wemo switches and the Wemo plugs. And now you've got the GUI, uh, you know, set up for Bitwise through an iPad, iPhone, or an Android to, you know, put some rock and graphics together to control it all. And so oh, Bitwise nice. is not a Belkin thing? That's like a separate no, project? No, separate, separate controller, but yep. someone has written some Python scripts to that let you the control Wemo. the Wemo stuff. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Yeah, SmartThings has similar. I mean, because SmartThings <laughs> supports Z-Wave and, and Zigbee. Mm -hmm. um, well, we got talking about. Oh, we were like worried about content for the show. Yeah, yeah. We started talking about the class where you can learn how to secure some of this yep, stuff. Yep, and, and we started talking about the wireless stuff going into my yeah and wireless we class. So we'll up. continue this discussion. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so wireless class six seventeen. Yeah, when in are you teaching that? Orlando in April, yep. Austin, Texas in May. Baltimore, Sandsfire in June, and Berlin, Germany in June as well. Nice. Um, I, just a couple of updates on T-shirts. Security Weekly listeners receive 10% off all products in our store with the discount code IHACKNAKED. That's shop.securityweekly.com. Purchase an encryption is not a crime T-shirt. And support the EFF and Hackers for Charity. And you get a discount on T-shirts. Is that right, Chris? Chris, findings. Okay. And what do they have to do? Show you proof? You have to email Chris. At, there's the beautiful hack naked shirts on our wonderful model. 
and it's even in red. Look at how beautiful our hack naked shirts are if you're watching the video. We have female versions uh -huh. with both the lady and the guy on that. Check that out, huh? Uh huh. huh. Shop.securityweekly.com. You can get so if you buy an encryption is not a crime t shirt, there it is up there on the screen now. You show proof that you've either donated to EFF or bought an encryption is not a crime t shirt. You send it to Chris at securityweekly.com and Chris will send you a ten percent off. An additional ten percent off. Ten dollars off. off. And that is K R I S. Oh, wow. Right. At security. K R I S at securityweekly.com. Not C H R I S. So that is the current t shirt promotion that we're running. So Very make sure nice. that you go get your hack naked gear. Because who doesn't want to wear a t shirt that says hack naked on it? Um, and that was it. So Paul Hendry joins us. Paul's been here before on the show. Paul's a senior science, uh, instructor and one of the world's foremost global information security and computer forensics experts with more than 30 years of experience covering all 10 domains of network security. Uh, Paul is a principal at VNet Security LLC uh, and has been a forensics analyst at Lumention Security for some time. Is that the Paul Henry introduction music, or is that, is that <laughs> someone's ringtone? Yeah. Um, so that's Paul, Paul Henry, that's Paul Henry not killing his phone. It's oh, no bad. worries, Paul. Welcome back to Security <laughs> Weekly. It's nice to have sure. you on this evening. Um, so, Paul, we were talking about uh, wireless protocols and Belkin Wemo, and that's what you have in your house. Yeah, I, I keep it. Uh, it's all in the house. I don't let it get out on the net. Yeah. Uh, so everything is behind a VPN. But yeah, I control a lot of the bar lights and all that fun stuff from it. Now, can you do the like if this then that? Oh yeah. Stuff with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to do more. Like smart sit things seems like it lets you do some of that out of the box, but like I want more flexibility. Yeah, but in order to use that, you've got to go with the internet connectivity. And oh, I'd rather really? okay. I'd rather keep my stuff off the net. Yeah, see, mine I do from my phone through, mm. through the cloud, like Nest. It yep. is, it's bad. It's bad. Uh, nice pathway into your network. It is. It is. Someone could change the lights on my glowing bed of love. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it would just ruin the moment for me. So I, I, I've got a forensics lab in the house. I'd really rather not have uh, have that accessible. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, Paul, you just need to use those sensors that are better for vibrate than yes any. yes <laughs> I, I do um, i can imagine at 3 a.m somebody turning on the siren yes <laughs> I don't the have siren it. goes whoop whoop <laughs> 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 so now paul you uh worked with lumention security so what um who is lumention and what are some other kind of similar products in that market and, and what problems are, are they solving well, Lumension has a full uh, endpoint uh, security suite as well as flow remediation product. They've got uh, LRM, Lumension Risk Manager, to help you with uh, policy management, policy enforcement. So it's really a, a fairly large suite of products that they've got together today. On the endpoint side, there's a lot of players in the space. Uh, we're seeing uh, a number of companies uh, jump into vulnerability uh, management as well. Tripwire uh, acquired a company here about what three or six months ago yeah, to Tripwire bought kinda, Encircle. Yeah, yeah, to, to move into it. We we saw VMware buy Shavlik and then mm -hmm. sell it off right away. Uh, but so those yeah, so are two different. I look at those as two different products, Paul. One tells you about what's wrong with your system, mm -hmm. and the Shavlik example can fix those problems. And there are mm -hmm. those are two very different products. Right. Usually they're they're incorporated together though. Is, the Lume, is Lumension solution incorporated together so you can yeah, find and fix in the same solution? Yeah, you've got Lumension Scan to scan the actual uh, vulnerabilities, and then you have the remediation product itself as well. Isn't there a conflict of interest there that the system reporting is also responsible for fixing? Uh, depends. Uh, matter of perspective there. Mm. No. Yeah. You, yeah, you'd want a Chinese wall somewhat. You know, if you're doing a vulnerability scan, you shouldn't be the guy doing the remediation. I can understand that. Right. But uh, when when we're talking about simply applying patches, I don't have an issue with it. So, uh, what, what, describe for me some of the state of, of endpoint security. I think it's a hot topic today. Um, I've been researching a lot, and I know folks like Palo Alto have come out with uh, some endpoint security products. And let's just talk... 
Tell me generally what, what your assessment is of these endpoint security products, which all have slightly different goals and solve, solve different yep. problems. It's, it's a really interesting space. I, I've always said if you don't get control of your endpoint, it's going to control you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bottom line there is uh, you know, Microsoft and their infinite wisdom uh, and you know, the, the problems they gave us with USBs over the years, you know, auto run and all that fun stuff, uh, made USBs just uh, an incredibly simple vector to work with. You know, Microsoft finally did uh, somewhat lock that down. They've patched auto run, we'll say, uh, but there are still ways around it. Uh, again, these products that provide security suites, uh, you know, for the endpoint today will typically control the USBs, whereby only specific serialized devices can be plugged in in the first place. Um, they, uh, mat you know, mandatory encryption is enforced on anything that's copied over to it. And one of the most important components of it is they actually keep a database of what has been copied to the USB stick. You know, we've had, we've had, we've had so many situations where a USB stick got, got lost and nobody had a clue what was on it. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a rather interesting tool set, but at the same time, you know, threats seem to be evolving faster than security products. Uh, I'm sure you heard at uh, Chaos Congress uh, last week or week before last, we had two UEFI, uh, you know, vulnerabilities that were uh, talked about a great deal. Uh, you know, one of them would require that you have to actually, you know, reverse engineer the bootloader and all that fun stuff in order to make it effective. Um, but it, it is a uh, it is a vector that's going to become more problematic over the next year or two. Once people start, uh, you know, being able to easily identify the device that uh, you know that it's been plugged into, uh, they've already done the reverse engineering on that boot script. It's going to be trivial to fully automate that. Uh, at the same do think, time, do you think that means more persistent malware? I know we've talked about that before when we talk about malware embedding itself inside of the hardware that's connected to the system already inside of the software that runs that, the firmware that runs that hardware, and your motherboard is no exception, and mm -hmm. the E, is it E-U-F-I? Did I say that right? I always get that bat acronym backwards. I, 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 I do too. U-E-F-I. U-E-F-I, yeah. -E thank you, Larry. Yeah. I have a little dyslexic there with that acronym. Like Stexic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. So, uh, but do you, uh, and I've seen a, a few instances of malware over the past 10 years of covering security news that may have actually done that in the wild and got reported on it. But I don't see that as a huge trend of persistence in malware today. I, I think it's uh, primarily going to be nation-state sponsored events, we'll say. Mm -hmm. uh, Are you, know, you saying it's cyber war, Paul? Is it cyber uh, war? No. No, I'm saying that uh, Okay, good. You said governments drink. I did. And that's the wrong drink. It is. This is the non-alcoholic drink. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. It's, it's malware only governments can afford. When you're printing the money, writing a check is no problem. Mm. Uh, no, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention. A better one was uh, actually talked about at uh, Chaos Congress as well. Have you heard of Thunderstrike? I have not. Thunderstrike yeah. rocks. Uh, it'll actually allow you to overwrite uh, Apple's uh, UEFI uh, via Thunderbolt. Right, oh, now, uh, yes. So I did hear. I did hear about that. The now here's the really cool part about that. It's viral. If you have an infected machine and someone else plugs another uh, Thunderbolt device into it, it'll infect that device. But we're talking now, about physical attacks. In order to go from Thunderbolt into UEFI, yep. you have to physically plug something into a Thunderbolt port. Hey, can yes, you, you do. Can you test this out for me? <laughs> That's USB. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you picked could, it up and I you thought about it. it for you. Yeah. Hold on. Oh, you didn't want me to put it in that port. Sorry. Uh -oh. <laughs> he wanted you to put it in the hole. They did this with Firewire before. Yes. Oh, yeah. Inception, man. Inception right. kind of rocked, too. Yep. Yep. Good stuff. But, I mean, if, if I'm an organization, let's back up for a moment, and there are these attacks where an attacker requires physical access to my systems, how worried should I be? How much money should I spend to solve this problem? And what technologies am I implementing based on my risk model about these physical attacks? Well, the bottom line is physical has trumped logical for 20 years, all right? Uh, the problem is many people don't budget anything for physical security. You know, you've got people that'll walk away from that desktop overnight, leaving it powered up with just a screensaver on it. Uh, Inception, Thunderstrike, many other tools uh, could be used while that system is still up and on. But uh, what's the what's the likelihood? I mean, how much am I how much am I gambling by saying, you know what, I'm not going to protect myself from this threat because the likelihood of it affecting my network is probably pretty low. 
Uh, disgruntled employees would be a, a, a vector. Uh, the cleaning crew could be a vector. A nation state, if you were specifically targeted, could be a vector. Uh, but, you know, a, a small you know, network. It's interesting you say that, Paul. I, w- I actually saw a talk by Dave Vitell this week, and Dave mm-hmm. was saying that it's not out of the realm of possibility that nation states, for example, when we talk about that specific attack, why can't they just buy employees at companies? I mean, let's say they write a check for hundreds of thousands of dollars for an employee to say, look, all you have to do is plug this thing into a system or implant this malware, and you're good to go. And they can buy off employees at companies that they want. And that happens, right? I mean, that's happening now. Actually, about two or three years ago, I believe it was the Secret Service, it might have been the FBI, put out a note Mm -hmm. that uh, cyber... uh, Cybercrime families, we'll say, organized crime, mm-hmm. was actually supplementing the income of IT people if they would take a job with a financial firm. And there might be a little something, something we'll need you to do down the road. Right. Like plug right. in a USB stick. That makes, what, total, yeah. that what, makes what, total sense. One day, I'm going to ask a favor of you. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's in your IT department, I mean, aren't you kind of screwed anyway? Well, it depends, man. I mean, this stuff can be locked down. Uh, most people don't take the, the trouble to do that. But if I'm in IT, can I unlock it? Uh, depends. Uh, again, uh, how they're dividing up responsibilities and all that fun stuff. You know, separation of duties comes into play. Uh, the higher the level of trust, the more stringent you're going to have to become. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was looking at some really cool stuff uh, just this afternoon. A company out of uh, Ocala, Florida has come out with these locks for RJ45 and USB ports. And uh, I'd never seen anything like that before. And uh, they're actually pretty cool. Uh, I'm Just to show you real quick, here's a couple of them sitting here. You can see that. There's an old Netgear. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, uh, those, those are the little locks for it. But man, uh, you've really got to pretty much destroy the uh, switch to get it out of there if you don't have the key for it. I'll call it uh, yeah. Deviant. So, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure Deviant can come up with it. Well, <laughs> yeah, so Paul, I uh, actually, I don't know. I haven't actually seen that particular yeah. lock or gotten Deviant's opinion I, I, on it. So I, I have I have a set of those that we were doing some testing for a customer, and we were mm-hmm. able to get one of their locks, but not the key. And turns out the key for these things is very simple, and in fact, mm-hmm. you could probably bypass with a pen cap, like a Bic pen. You take mm-hmm. the cap off with a little thing and put it in and turn it. Um, it would be very easy to 3D print your own keys. You gotcha. Uh, I think they well, were the, the Panduit, Panduit ones or something of the like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these again, uh, they're not going to stop a determined bad guy. Uh, mm-hmm. But they are they are a reasonable detective control. They are serialized. You can very quickly tell physically by looking at it if someone had attempted to gain access. Yep, that's uh, a good indicator. It, it's, it's certainly better than nothing. The problem is too many people do nothing. I mean, Paul, you've been to a lot of hotels and a lot of conferences. Mm-hmm. Look at how many RJ45s are available in not very high traffic areas that you can pretty much plug into at your leisure. Like the, you know, uh, Bob, like, like Bob tells me the closet in your room, which yeah, is where, where, where you're the, going there. Where the access point usually is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of nuts. All and from, yeah, from that RJ45, you got access to their servers, their SIP server. It's just game on. <laughs> well, one of the nice things about access points, too, you know, that's actually a great example because in often case, that is a dot one Q on a network. So not only do you get access to some sort of internal network segment, you get access to multiple internal network segments. <laughs> yep. Um, so Paul, let's go back to endpoint security. So mm-hmm. what are the what are some of the other players in the endpoint security market, especially with respects to Lumension, right? So from what I understand you I heard you before, Lumension will check for patch status mm-hmm. in addition to allowing for you to install patches, correct? That's correct, yes. And that's not just operating system patches, that's third party applications as well. Third third party. They're they're well, I'm sure you've heard of Secuna. Have you ever played with Secuna PSI? No, I have not. If you've got a Windows box, you need to download it. It's absolutely free. It <clears throat> patches pretty much everything. Wireshark, uh, any of the browser helper objects. Yeah. Okay, so Secuna's um, endpoint this- protection product yeah this is their yep. free one for home users okay. uh, they've got but they have got, a commercial one too that 
Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yep. Uh, well, Lumension, I would say, has equivalent uh, depth and breadth as the uh, Secuna product. Uh, Shavlik seemed to be a little bit too focused on uh, on Microsoft, but they did a little bit of Oracle. You know, you you really have to check to see what coverage you're getting from that flow remediation so product. Vendors in this space have different coverage. Oh, as, absolutely. As, like with any other security vendor space, right? Yep. Yep. So my recommendation gotcha. has always been to scan for software and then align uh, the remediation product based on its coverage. Mm. And now, once you have one of these products, this is this is an interesting question, Paul. I'm curious to hear your answer to this. If you have a product that's installing third-party software and operating system patches, what do you recommend to customers that and to help them ensure that all of that is happening? Because there's a lot of moving parts to that. I normally tell them to go with Nessus. You should use something. Uh, See, I took a risk there, <laughs> and it paid <laughs> off, right? <laughs> no, the, you know, you, you want to always check uh, <laughs> from using a product from a disparate vendor, disparate technology, all that fun stuff. You're going to eliminate common, what I like to call common mode fault mm -hmm. in doing that. It's interesting, though, as we you know move through the space, there's a lot of software that seems to be installed on end-user systems. How do you, as a security person, deal with the systems administrator and say, we really need to have some kind of endpoint protection software on these endpoints. Mm -hmm. We really need to have some kind of patch checking mechanism that may require either credentials or some kind of software on the system. Mm -hmm. We need some kind of validation that all of that is happening. Um, well, how do you convince the sysadmins that they need all that, you know, they're on agent overload right now. What do, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Here's the bottom line on it you're not going to until they felt some pain. Mm. It's, it's a simple fact of life. People aren't going to spend money unless they have to. And uh, again, once they've had some kind of an incident, usually uh, you know, the budget dollars open up for it. Mm. Not just budget, but what about their willingness to install all of this agent software? I mean, they have performance concerns. Mm -hmm. They have availability. Well, I should say first, right? The number one thing that sysadmins are concerned about, what is it, Larry? Uptime. Yeah, uptime, right? Mm -hmm. That's their primary concern. You know, after that mm -hmm. is performance, but number two relates to number one, performance. They really just care about that the performance doesn't degrade enough that it impacts uptime. So well, uh, uh, again, though, uh, security stays at the lower rung of the ladder until you, you've had an incident, you've been breached. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, again, security becomes, uh, you know, top line, we'll say. And, uh, you know, budget becomes allocated. You're going to put up with the performance hit you're going to take. You're going to put up with the additional administrative burden, all in, uh, in view of trying to improve your security posture. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, a lot of this technology, in speaking of maintenance and improving the security or improving the overall health of your systems, mm -hmm. do you think we have to deal with this agent <clears throat> endpoint you know, in software and in that it helps us maintain our systems better? But in order to maintain our systems better, we have to add this other software. It seems like a weird thing to me. Well, it, it's a vendor problem as far as I'm concerned. Let's take two contrasts here. Uh, Lumension, they purchased a number of different technologies over the years, and they've embedded that technology in the Lumension product suite. Now, one of the first things Lumension does is they uh, rewrite their agent uh, so it can perform the functions of that technology they acquired. The last thing they do is incorporate it into their central GUI. So here you'll have Lumension that's going to have multiple functions with a single agent, but you've got to fire up multiple GUIs to manage it. Now mm -hmm. contrast that Contrast that with McAfee. With McAfee, when they acquire a technology, usually the first thing they do is they pull it up into EPO, their central console, yep. reduces administrative burden, but now you're running two, three, or four agents on your box. Uh, for that technology that they've acquired to be able to get it up into EPO. Gee, see, now, I, see I was going to say something different. Usually the first thing they do is destroy the technology, but that's a different story <laughs> altogether. I'm going to be nice. So <laughs> I, I, no, no, Larry, <laughs> you're thinking of CA, but... Um, uh, no, no, Did no. I say that out loud? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but so, it, like, with EPO as an example, is it better to have multiple agents or is it better to find a solution that consolidates everything down into one agent? But I feel like the problem there is that agent's doing too much and it's taking up too much of a footprint. I almost kind of feel like maybe I should just sprinkle very small agents throughout my environment and have them kind of act like a 
hive or a collective, and maybe that's better. But I'm not, I'm not sure of the right answer here. In, in, in my view, the single agent's the better approach. Again, if you're going to reassemble the stream of data, put the fragments in the right order, all that fun stuff, uh, you've got the packet ready for inspection. Why not let all of the technologies that need to inspect it inspect it at that point in time, rather than having each agent you know, doing the same work over and over and over again? It just makes more sense. It's more efficient uh, to bring it down to a single agent. Now, on a common uh, you know, operating platform like EPO, i got to tell you, I've worked a lot of incidents where they had EPO, and I absolutely loved working with it. Uh, you know, I could dig down to datagram levels oh, so yeah. quickly. Uh, it, it is just a tremendous, tremendous capability that's lacking in, in most GUI front ends for most security products. So they, they definitely have a seller there. And, and if you look at market share, uh, you know, You've got companies like McAfee that are dominating the space because they have that centralized console. They've got that reduction in administrative burden, uh, even though you're paying a performance penalty for the multiple agents on the box. I got you. And Mr. Henry, I'm, I'm with you on EPO and the awesomeness. We used to use that many years ago in healthcare organization I was at, uh, wow. and we wrote our own custom dashboards and... You migrated to another solution because of cost, and quite honestly, the, the information that we wanted just wasn't retrievable because of the, the lack of openness for being able yeah. to run custom dashboards. And, yeah. And in, in an incident, it's priceless. I had one uh, in the last year where just looking at traffic flows, uh, saw something unusual, uh, quickly identified uh, that software, it's no problem, bro. It was some DDoS software. And uh, found 59 compromised machines. Was able to get right to those machines, and it, we only spent uh, probably half a day nice. in front yeah, of EPO. The question I have with EPO, though, is how long is Intel going to support McAfee? I don't think that was a very smart acquisition, to put it lightly. It, it really depends on where they go with it. I mean, have you looked at the SGX processor I have not. from Intel? You need to. Go to uh, Jonah were they able? Were they ever able to embed any of the McAfee technologies into a chip, though? Well, let me try to explain what SGS, SGX is doing right now. Uh, with the SGX processor family, they're eliminating anything ever residing in RAM unencrypted. Everything will be encrypted. It will only be decrypted in the processor in a register just before it's acted upon. Hmm. It's going to eliminate. It's going to eliminate, in their view. Uh, any uh, you know RAM-based malware, we'll say. You can't get it to run unless it's properly signed, although signatures are pretty much freaking worthless today, uh, and all that fun stuff. But on the con side of it, it's going to elim eliminate our ability to reverse engineer things that are in RAM. Now, Jonah Rakowska on her Invisible Things blog mm -hmm. has written two really insightful papers, one pro, one con. Uh, do check that out. It's good stuff. Uh, now, for myself, when you know SGX is already out there, it's not widespread. Uh, it it's apparently going to take them a couple of years to really get this rolled out, but when it does, man, I'm I'm short in Intel and I'm going long on AMD. <laughs> People don't like to be told what they can run on their hardware, and this is going to give Intel the ability to literally control what you can run. Uh, another thing about this, just to open it up for conversation, is uh, you know we we've talked about how as Americans we don't want government to have a uh, an internet kill switch. Uh, SGX technology gives it to them. They can at any point in time revoke the certificate for Skype, for chat, uh, etc., and literally shut it down on every process, you know, every machine running the Intel SGX processor. That's interesting. That's scary. That's very scary. Yeah, it's frightening. And <laughs> if they shut down my browsers, I won't be able to get porn, and that's a problem. <laughs> no, you'll be able to get well, it because I know you have a NAS at home full of it. Well, that's. <laughs> may or may not be true, Larry. Get but new, get porn. new porn is, hmm. yeah, yeah, because that same old '70s stuff. I mean, come on. I had to just go through my NAS and delete a bunch of stuff because I needed room for new stuff. I mean, I don't have that much porn. I swear. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, where were we? How did we get? How did we get here? I think Shutting that's a um, Paul just raised uh, not Paul Asadorian, but but Paul raised a, a really important point. I mean, having the uh, certificate control right at the processor—that's kind of scary power, right there. <laughs> it is. It is. And, uh, I, I don't hear a lot of people talking about that, but that gives government the internet kill switch. Just kind of backdoors it in there for them. So, John, I mean, uh, Carlos, how much do endpoint protection type? Technologies slow you down when you're attacking the endpoint. 
Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, it depends like on the uh, on the assessment of the solution. Uh, many times, when you have a proper assessment that knows how to configure the solution and knows what to look for, they tend to be quite effective. Uh, I've gotten many calls. So wait, from what you're saying, and, Carlos, is it's not about the tool; it's how you use it. Correct. Hey, let me drive uh, a point. Let me drive a point home on that. Remember the Home Bob, Depot breach. The Home Depot breach. Yeah, they purchased yep. the semantic endpoint management package two years ago, paid for it, never deployed, never deployed it. Deployed it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, I'd like to respond to that. Go and ahead, Jeff. And it, and it comes down to this. Um, I have gotten to the point where it just does not concern me at all if. Um, a standard, a signature-based antivirus type endpoint protection is on there at all. I just walk right around it. I mean, it just isn't. N nothing I do um, is is going to um, trigger that device and mostly uh, that that software. And mostly because uh, anything that I run is never going to touch the disk. It's always injected into memory. Uh, it's it's you know spun up as a thread, um, and and the product just can't touch it. Um, so yeah, that's why I laughed out loud because it's it it just has become a bit of a joke. Well, it depends on the product. There was a company out of Austin, Texas, that actually did whitelisting in RAM. So if you inserted a metaterpreter into a running process or a piece of malware, it would pick it up. That technology was acquired uh, back in I think June by Lumension. Uh, they're now embedding that into Lumension's whitelisting product. What about uh, power, you know, what about PowerShell? What about it? What if I execute PowerShell? Does that get triggered, caught by well, anything? It depends. Has it been whitelisted? Is it permitted? Uh, do you have specific Power scripts you're running in PowerShell? Are they permitted? Yeah, so so one of my standard techniques, and, and we talk to this with customers quite a lot, is we'll use PowerShell and, and inject, a, um, inject a thread into memory with a PowerShell script. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. I know a lot of penetration testers do that. Um, and PowerShell is very commonly whitelisted. I mean, it's it's allowed in a lot of environments yep. because to disallow it would be to severely limit the functionality of the environment. Because if you look at a Win two K eight Win twenty twelve kind of environment now, they, they will die by PowerShell. <laughs> but but right. but if they if they are actually inspecting the running binary, you would see a change in the binary. You'd see a change in the size. You'd see a change in the hash, etc. And that should generate alerts. Right. Th that's, so it that's why I say it depends on the sysadmin. Uh, yeah. if, if I'm a sysadmin, I'm running PowerShell, and I say, okay, I'm going to use PowerShell for SharePoint for a change. I'm going to use it for this Active Directory tasks. Who are the users that actually need PowerShell? Oh, these are the users. Okay, let me go and enable SRP uh, uh, on on my boxes. Let's see what are the DLLs that PowerShell is calling. Let's look at the XE. Now let me block those DLLs. Let me go into the .NET cache, block those DLLs. Let me block PowerShell. Now I have my policy and it's only going to go to those users. Then I just limit the use of PowerShell in that environment without impacting my uh, production. But the thing is, it takes work. And a lot of yep. sysadmins actually do not want to go through that work until they feel pain. Once they feel pain, they go back and they fix that stuff, which has happened with some of my friends that I help consult with, which have gone into an environment, they've used PowerShell, they've used other tools, they've ripped a new one to the customer uh, during the pen test, and then what they they go a year after that, and th what they're seeing is the, cu the customer's now smarter, they're blocking that stuff, they went through all of that work because they felt the pain. That's why I say yep. it depends on the sysadmin. Yeah. And again, it's that, that pain yeah, driver. Uh, you know, i got to tell you something new I've been doing here for about the last six months. I've got one of my clients I'm under retainer with, and we're actually doing tabletop intrusions into their network. Uh, it's a group of six facilities, and we bring their administrators in. Uh, we sit down. Actually, I uh, had to do this one from New Orleans the day before the SANS conference. And it's about a two-hour call. And we walk through some basic scenarios. They have to then respond back with, well, is this a, an incident or is it just an event? Um, then go beyond that and start looking at how they would properly escalate that. 
And I, I've got to tell you, every time we've done it, we've found at least uh, half a dozen to a dozen holes in their current incident response pra you know, practices and procedures. Uh, not enough companies do that. Again, you, you wait until you have an incident, you feel the pain, and then you start taking care of stuff. Uh, again, just doing basic tabletop stuff, walking through scenarios is just really eye-opening uh, as to where the holes are in your network. Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I've got to say, um, Carlos, to your point, uh, we have had customers that have come back after we've used the techniques and, and asked us, what did you use and how can we protect against it? Can we go through the, the process of, uh, of locking that down? And, and some of them have, which to their credit, you know, improve their process, uh, processes and, and, and improve their uh, defense um, stature in, in, in that game. But that, I think that's, um, um, that's the very security conscious customer. That's actually, unfortunately, the minority uh, and not the majority. But uh, it's, it's good that we've had that happen anyway. Yeah, I've got one client doing the tabletop stuff. Uh, nobody else wants to put the time into it. Sad. Yeah, th th that's why I say security is like exercise. A lot of people actually know they need to exercise. They know, probably some of them don't know how to do it well. Some of uh, others have spent time reading on it and getting somebody to advise them on how to get some exercise. Others just go like, okay, I'll do it one day. They go to the doctor and say, so you're about to have diabetes or you're about to have a heart attack or hey dude uh, I think you have cancer now all of a sudden they're dieting they're doing all of the exercise they're doing all of that stuff it's just human nature just like you can say with smoking people know smoking is bad I'm gonna drop it but until they don't get one of those scares they don't start doing the right thing yeah, and people but not, you know not know patching that your system doesn't mean you're gonna die so yeah uh, th that's why I say it's kind of like human nature we know that we have to do some stuff but until we don't feel that pressure or pain to do it we don't do it so dave i tell described it more like hygiene like washing your hands showering brushing your teeth kind of thing i think yep. that more closely relates to what you were saying carlos uh in terms of an analogy um and because a lot of times poor hygiene in terms of washing your hands brushing your teeth showering doesn't mean you're going to die. Like you have to go a really long time without showering or brushing your teeth or washing your hands to die, right? Yeah. You can that's get sick. You can get sick, right? And that's a consequence of that. And I think that's kind of the same thing with uh, a breach, right? I mean, that means you're you're getting sick. And Sony, well, right, Sony right now has a really, really bad illness. <laughs> and well, yeah, and well, there's well, different well. levels, right? But it's, it's about hygiene and doing things uh, over time and doing them uh, in a similar way to protect against the threats. And Dave also talked about it. I thought it was kind of interesting. And I actually saw this in the restroom. He said, you know, people bring their coffee cups into the restroom and then leave them on the sink. And there's people washing their hands. And, like, there's stuff splashing in the coffee cup. Like, that's just not good hygiene. I don't understand it. Right, and then right. later on in the day, I'm in the restroom and I see someone left a coffee cup there. I'm like, did Dave do that on purpose? Did someone do that on purpose and like do an experiment? You know, it's even worse. It was really you good. Know, it's even worse when they don't leave it on the back of the sink when they leave it on the back of the urinal. Oh yeah, that's because uh -oh. <laughs> then there's yeah, all know, then there's that, different that, things splashing in it, which is gross. That, there's there's one point that I think has has got to be emphasized as well, and and I've seen this with, in in some of my dealings. We we have a cultural challenge in um, uh, that varies between between um, our different and customers. Some some come back with a very strong response where they've got a lot of top down support, you know, to 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 fix that that hygiene problem. And those are the ones that are more likely going to be successful, right? And we have mm -hmm. others that come back and the, and, and, and their security department or, or, or the folks that are commissioning the test, they just don't have that top down support. And um, it's very hard for people to change their hygiene habits if they don't have a culture that supports it. Mm -hmm. Is that and that's, so? That's all the point I've got. <laughs> is that a culture you can change? Is that a culture you can build? And if so, what do you do to build that culture? You asking me, Paul? Or are you asking or Paul, Paul? Anyone, anyone, anyone that wants to answer. <laughs> well, anyone who's I'm, brave enough to take on that question. Again. I think it is. I think it is a culture you can change. I'll, I'll give you that yeah, okay. opinion. Pain. But. 
Pain changes it. Money changes it. Again, yeah, when you exactly. when, once you felt the pain, I got, I got to tell you, I am really happy to see uh, new things coming out right now. For a long time, I've always said we need a federal breach reporting law. And uh, it looks like we've got one coming right around the corner. Many states have them, all right? But until people can't, you know, are, are prevented from just shuffling this stuff under the carpet, they've got to deal with it publicly. Uh, they're going to keep doing it, you know. And, and again, from what I'm understanding, I haven't read it yet, but I do believe there is a new federal mandate with a 30-day reporting requirement on it uh, for exposure of PII. There is, yeah. Network. It's been it's been proposed, Paul. It hasn't. Uh, it has to go through the Senate right before. Well, until we have that, yeah. people won't act. I mean, a lot of people get upset with me because I'm kind of pro-regulation because I'm tired of people not doing the right thing, okay? If everybody did the right thing, we wouldn't need regulation, but nobody's going to do anything unless they absolutely have to nowadays from a, a money spend perspective for security. And it's so almost I, like public I, shaming, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Mm. Yeah, remember yeah, the, old, the old there's a, sites? There's a threshold point. I, I don't know if you agree with this or not, Paul, not my Paul, but you, the other Paul. Um, I like I how Joff is like is my um, his Paul. That's special. Oh, oh isn't that nice? <laughs> anyway, that, that, that's going to be a distraction. But but there's there's I think we've lived in a culture for a while where people would do security, but with a compliance driver, right? So they they'd go check off the list. Like we've got one of those boxes, and we got one of those boxes, and we've done our PCI thing, and we've done this and that. And they check off the list, but but it still didn't solve the problem, right? They, they, it was a checklist kind of thing. But with some of the the increasing regulations, I think the pain threshold is going to get to the point that kind of pushes them over the proactive barrier um, instead of that reactive checklist kind of position. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we that's where I think we hope people go to, right? Where they're like, oh, we really do need to be you know, really proactive. We need our security guys to be good. We need them to be commissioning pen tests. We need them to be doing proactive vulnerability assessments and this and that and all the things that go along with the, the well-managed security program. But So but you're that, saying they need a penetration test from Black Hills Information Security and they need well, continuous monitoring <laughs> from Tenable Network Security. I think right. it's... I think that's what Joff is saying, right? Did I hear that wrong? Yeah, okay. and, then, and then next year they need to get a pen test from Guardians, yeah. <laughs> Or if they want somebody to come in and do it right. I mean, just kidding. Well, I'm, either, I'm no, really no. talking about that inflection point, though, that, that where people move from that reactive stance to that proactive stance. And I think with the amount of publicity we've, we've received on breaches in the past year, that we are getting people closer and closer to that proactive stance, uh, at least in their thinking. Um, and well, I guess well, a bit of an just, idea. Uh, just, 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 to, just to drill in a little bit deeper here. In the first place, you made a you, Jerry. You mentioned the word PCI and security in the same sentence. <gasps> oh, my. Uh, PCI is a brand. It's not a standard by, by any stretch of the imagination. We do have some good stuff out there. Uh, have you looked at FedRAMP? I've heard that term. I have not. Do, do a search on FedRAMP. FedRAMP is a new standard being put together by NIST for cloud computing. Man, I got to tell you, it's it's just starting to roll out, but it's got some teeth in it. It really does. Uh, PCI is uh, <laughs> it's a brand, and I'll leave it at that. I'll behave. Uh, but again, we we need good regulation, uh, and I think that will drive people to becoming, as he indicated, proactive instead of simply being reactive all the time. Cool. Um, any closing thoughts or questions from our illustrious panel and Paul Henry included? Again, thank you for coming on the show, Paul. Well, when are you guys going to start shipping bourbon to people who are about to be on the show? This you know, just ain't right, You're not man. the first person that has requested <laughs> and, that. And you know what? There's some precedence because I just saw it t t late last night and this morning that uh, some of the drug cartels are using drones to try to get meth over the Yeah, border. yeah one just, one just crashed, crashed at the border. Yeah, so and by two pounds. Yeah, mm. they got their their calculations wrong by two pounds. So remember, folks. imagine like sitting there in your backyard, and all of a sudden, like like ten pounds of meth just crashes in your backyard. <laughs> uh, remember, remember folks, one I, kilo, I, maybe two, never three. I, I, Dude, I, have you, haven't have you slept ever been, in a week. Shop, have you shopping ever, from my back deck with a twelve gauge is yes. sounding more and more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> you you well, gotta you try. Can see, you got to try have fishing a couple of in South things. Florida. You got to try fishing in South Florida. We call it square grouper. 
Sometimes you find those square grouper washed up on the beach. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, yep. Paul, I, I don't know if you played five questions the last time you were on Security Weekly. No. Okay. Are you ready to play five questions? Sure. Three words to describe yourself. Oh, man. That's two. That's two. <laughs> oh, man. Shit. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll give you just one, just driven. Simple as that. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Hmm. Hands. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? It would have to be an idiot something or other. In the popular, in the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Oh, first. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. Living or dead, uh, cartoon or otherwise. Yes. Mm. This is where we stall to give you time. It's okay. Oh, my. I'd go with the redhead on uh, that 70s show. Uh, Laura Prepon. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Charlie Sheen for the dad. I think I could learn something there. Nice. Nice. Mm. Paul Henry, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. Always nice to chat with you. I hope to see you at a Sands event probably at some point this year. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we'll catch up. Thanks, Paul. Bye. Take care, guys. Take care. Thanks, Paul. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about our stories for this week. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Take advantage of our T-shirt contest discount thing we have going on. Follow us on Twitter, at Sign Security Weekly. And uh, people are asking on Twitter how do they get in on that uh, contest. So you got to buy. You got to show proof of purchase of donating to the EFF. Or one of our, our good friends on Twitter is selling Encryption is Not a Crime t-shirts. To benefit EFF and Hackers for Charity. There's information in the show notes. Yep, Encryption is Not a Crime t-shirt. So donate and or buy one of those and you get $10 off. You got to email chris at securityweekly.com. We make you jump through some hoops here because $10 is a big discount off our t-shirts. So yeah, considering yeah. the t-shirts aren't much more than that. That's, yeah. <laughs> so. so yeah, get on that. And with that, we're going to take a short break. Come back. With our stories of the week. <laughs> 